Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for your blessing. We need the blessing of God upon our lives, and we covet it. We seek it. Lord, we thank you for it. And I know that that blessing comes with conditions. This time and time again, your word says, Blessed is the man that does this. Blessed is the man that does so and so. Lord, there's conditions with those blessings. And we recognize that. Lord, that's where the striving comes in. That's where the fight, that's where the walk comes in. And I'm asking today that you would anoint each one of our hearts to be able to hear what you want to speak in our lives today. Lord, I'm asking you would anoint my spirit with the words of truth and the words of life for this generation. God, we need the anointing in this day and in this hour. We need to understand it, but Lord, more importantly, we need to walk in it. And I'm asking today that we as your people would choose to walk in the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And I thank you for helping us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, how many of y'all want more anointing in your life? Amen. I think most of us understand the anointing to a certain measure. And I'm not here today to try to dissect it or try to figure it out. But I am here today to talk about it. And hopefully talking about it will stir up our minds and our desire, rather. I think more than anything is we need a desire for the anointing at work in our life. Um, Nicodemus didn't really understand it. And uh, because the anointing is that it's the unseen force and the blessing of the Holy Ghost that works in men and women's lives. It's the power that we need to live victorious everyday lives. It's the abiding presence of the Holy Ghost, that unseen force that guides the life of believers. I believe that anointing shapes our character to become more like Jesus. Now, let's turn to Exodus 40, verse 9, and take a little bit of a look at the anointing. And... Uh, how it was used in the Old Testament. I believe that the anointing, one of the things the anointing oil did and still does, back then it came in the form of olive oil. Today it's called the anointing of the Holy Ghost, which is symbolized many times by us anointing men and women symbolically referring to that uh, anointing. But in Exodus verse 40, verse 9, it says, And thou shalt take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is therein and shalt hollow it and all the vessels thereof and it shall be holy. Another word for hallow is to consecrate it. The, the anointing of the Holy Ghost in this day and age causes ordinary women, men and women, to do things that we couldn't ordinarily do on our own strength. In the Old Testament, it was used to consecrate ordinary things to make them become holy. Keep reading verse 10. And it says, Thou shalt anoint the altar of the burnt offering and all his vessels and sanctify the altar, and it shall be an altar most holy. And thou shalt anoint the laver in his foot and sanctify it. And then in verse 12, it talks about, And thou shalt bring Aaron and his sons unto the door of the tabernacle, the congregation, and wash them with pure water. Now, washing, the washing of the water in the New Testament, it talks about the washing of the water by the Word. So, it's a symbol of the Word, word of God washing us and, and cleansing us. And, and it goes on to say, it says, 
And thou shalt put upon Aaron the holy garments and anoint him and sanctify him that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And thou shalt bring his sons and clothe them with coats. And thou shalt anoint them as thou didst anoint their father that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. For their anointing shall be an everlasting priesthood throughout their generations. Thus did Moses according to all that the Lord commanded him, and so did he. So let's go to uh, 1 John 2. Uh, let's look at the New Testament where it talks about the anointing. 1 John chapter 2 all the way to the other end of the Bible. Beginning reading at verse 18, little children, it's the last time and you've heard that Antichrist shall come. And even now there are many Antichrists whereby we know that it's the last time. And they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. That's scary. That's a scary Bible verse right there. Verse 20, but you, hopefully that's you and I, hopefully you can say that's me. Maybe today you can make the decision and say that's going to be me. If you haven't made that decision in your life, today's your day. But you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. And that unction is the anointing in the Amplified. It says, you have been anointed by, and you hold a sacred appointment from that you have been given an unction from the Holy One. In verse 21, uh, continuing to read in the King James Version of 1 John chapter 2. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it. How do we know it? Because we have an unction. Because... There's been an endowment of our great God placed upon you and I's life that have chosen to walk with God and make the Christian living part of who we are and our lifestyle from here on out. And really, if we decide to uh, become a child of the living God, there really isn't another option, although some may say there is. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lies are the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same is not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Now verse 24 is, uh, has some interesting things to say. It says, Let that therefore abide in you, which you have heard from the beginning. Now, many of us in here, not all of us, but many of us, we've been Christians for, at the very least, 5, 10, some 20, 30 years. For a good part of your life, you've been a believer. And from time to time, we need to be reminded of those early days in Christ. It's those early days in the Lord Jesus Christ where God came upon our lives. And when we said yes to him, when we surrendered to him, there was an anointing came upon our life. And that anointing caused brokenness in our hearts. It caused repentance and it caused us to see God in a, in a way that we had never seen him before in our life. And right here, uh, John is admonishing uh, those that he's writing to, he says, make sure, he said, let that therefore abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. If that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, don't forget that time. Don't forget what God did in your heart because over the years, life has a way of, of trying to, life and circumstances and people and, and a combination of all those three, uh, has a way of steering us away from that original path. 
And uh, 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 there's a verse that kept coming to me this week. It talks about giving heed to seducing spirits. I don't want to be that person. I want to be a person that stays broken in the presence of God. Because seducing spirits work. The uh, seducing spirits of this world and, and of the, the religious world that many of us have been and were a part of, those seducing spirits seduce those that instead of surrendering to the Holy Ghost, they continue to bow to the altar of reason and logic. And did you know that's where most of the well-to-do academic culture is? Every day they bow to the altar of reason and logic. And because of that, these seducing spirits come in and deviate them away from the truth. That's why you and I have heard so many stories of, of well-meaning young people, good men and women that have, have gone into our uh, many of our seminaries and even uh, become part of many churches, where they've steered them away from the truth. And now you have something that is different from the pathway that God, where, where God came upon you and set you free. Because we look to an altar that was different than to the altar of the Word of God and, and, and surrender to the Holy Ghost. So that's why reason and logic is very fearful to me. Um, I'm seeing the importance, the more I walk with God, I'm seeing the importance of simplicity. I'm seeing the importance of keeping our lives simple. I'm seeing the importance of not becoming careful and troubled about many things. Isn't that where Martha found herself that day? She was hustling and bustling around. She was doing things. And she was kind of getting pent up, frustrated. And Jesus, now, the, the very God of this universe that created every little detail of the world and the universe around us, he looks at her and he says, Martha, why are you careful and troubled about many things? Could it be that the clutter of our lives and all the details of our lives that, although we can't shirk them, we can't walk away from many of them, but what, what could you and I do in our personal everyday lives that would declutter our world. What could we do? For each one of us, it may be a little different. But I've been thinking about this here recently. What can I do to get rid of the clutter in my life that so often clouds the vision of God and my pursuit after God and what He wants to do in my life? Just a thought. So let's keep on reading. And this is the promise that He has promised us, even eternal life, in verse 25. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing which you have received, if you have said yes to God in your life, there is a measure of the anointing of God has come upon you. And that anointing is designed, its main purpose is to destroy the yokes of bondage that, keep, that clouds our vision, that gets us steered off the pathway of what God wants for your life. These things I have written unto them, unto you concerning them that seduce you, but the anointing which you have received, it's you and I, 
of Him, it abides in you. The anointing of God, whether you feel it or not, there's a power inside of us that we need to realize is there. Not in a proud, arrogant manner, but we need to understand that we are the temple of the living God. The anointing power of the Holy Ghost lives inside of us. And it's the agenda of hell to clutter our world, to keep that thing stifled, to keep that seed in there, and as long as it's a seed, it's never going to hurt my world. So says the prince of darkness. If I can keep that thing in there and keep believers from realizing who God actually is inside of them. If I can keep believers from realizing the call of God that's on their life, I can accomplish my plan. That's the prince of darkness. That's the world. He can accomplish his plan in your life. But the anointing that you have received of him abideth in you. And you need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you all, of all things, and is truth, and is no lie. And even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. Now, this anointing, the presence of the Holy Ghost in your life, wants to help you be able to figure out the uncertain things in your life. It is there for a purpose. It doesn't say that, oh, well, praise God, you know, the anointing's inside of me, and, you know, I'm good to go. I can figure this thing out on myself. I can do my own thing, uh, move away from, isolate myself from Christian people. That's not what it's talking about. We just read that we have an unction from the Holy One. And we know all things. Did you realize the answers that you need in your life are inside of you? Now, we know this, but do we really know it? Do we realize the extent of how much God wants to liberate His people. He wants to set us free. He wants to free up the world of our emotions and our thoughts. He wants to destroy the bondages of unforgiveness and, 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 and things that people have done to you and I in the past and have said. He wants to set us free. That's his will, that's his plan, that's his purpose. But so often, we have a preconceived idea of what that freedom is. And so when the Holy Ghost comes knocking, we say, uh, that's bondage. I can't do what I want to do. That's where we get ourselves in trouble. We deviate from the path that God put us on in the beginning. Remember the former days in which you were enlightened? And the Bible asks that question. The former days where heaven's fire was stirring in your soul. You might have been a young person. You might have been, I don't know how old you were when it happened. But we need to remember those days. And we need to understand that it's the will of God for that fire to stay lit for the rest of our life. Now are we going to feel those old same emotions again and, uh, for the rest of our life? Maybe from time to time. But probably not every day. We may go through dry times. 
where we don't necessarily feel the love. Now, it can often be compared to the day you got married to your wife or your husband. There was a fire inside of you. you had, or or maybe, maybe the first time you courted or dated or whatever you did that caused that inside of you just to go rumly tumly butterfly Loosey goosey juicy <laughs> love. Amen. But it did something to you. And it set your world in a different direction. And so God, when His Spirit comes upon our life, it's much the same way. I experienced it in my life. And so that's, the, that's, that's what the anointing does when it comes on you. And we need to remember those days. We need to understand now that as a child of the living God, it's my responsibility to meet the conditions that God has in this word for his blessing to come upon my life. Well, brother, there shouldn't be conditions to the blessing of God. Go read the Bible. Go read Matthew 5. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. You want to see God? Be pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. You want to be a child of God? You are called into the greatest peace corps on the face of this earth. We're part of a peace corps. We've been called to bring the end agenda of the war between light and darkness is to bring peace. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and hate you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. You want to be blessed? There's conditions. You want to walk in the anointing? Start walking with God. And so... What's going to happen in this church and what is happening in, 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 in many people's lives in this day and generation is God's got his eyes on the young people of our generation. You young people, you 16, 17, 18, 20 years old, and God's after you. And we go through seasons and generations like this. And I don't know what God's going to do with this generation 10 years down. I don't know. But he's coming after them. Now, for those of us that have experienced the good gift of God and have experienced that time in our life 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, you want in on this? You want in on the next wave that God's bringing to planet Earth? We're going to have to stir ourselves up to get it. It's going to be a little different. Because we've been walking with God. There's more responsibility. Listen, those young children that, that we have in our homes, we bless them with food as parents. We work for them and we, we do. And we bless. God wants to do the same thing to new believers. If, if you have, if there is a cry in your heart as a young person, or maybe you've never accepted Jesus in your heart as your life, if there's a cry in your heart, God wants to, he wants to, he wants to feed you. He wants to take the storehouses of heaven and put them on your life and bless you and help you and anoint you and make you feel so loved and, 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 and free and happy because, because of who he is. He wants to turn you on. Now, I believe as, as Christians, you and I that have been walking with God for any number of years, God still wants to do the same thing to us. He wants, he wants to bless us and help us. But I also understand that there comes a time when the child grows up 
And they leave the house and they're on their own. And now mama and daddy ain't going to provide for them anymore. So you got to go out and work and you actually got to put some effort into feeding and clothing yourself. So maybe that's a little more where we're at is, as what we term mature Christians. Or Christians that have been walking with God. We're going to have to stir ourselves up. So I believe that we need to expect the anointing. I believe that you and I, it is the will of God for us to expect miracles. But that wise man, that wise woman that has been walking with God, you know what's the first question they're going to ask? God, what's the first step? What have I got to do in my life to let that be reality in my life? Brother, all you're talking about is works and all this stuff, and I don't believe a thing you're... Well, go check the Bible. I'm not talking about your justification before God. That's not what I'm talking about. That has nothing to do with works. That came because you were, you were saved. You were, I'm talking about those of you and I that are choosing to walk with God and, 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 and make this a lifetime of walking with Him. There's responsibility that happens. And we need to be aware of it. And we need to understand that the anointing is working in us, and that anointing is going to continually guide us and help us and lead us and teach us. Because the overwhelming things of life and the decisions and the uncertainty, we just read that you have an unction from the Holy One, and you say, that's me. That's me. Know all things. I looked at that verse the other night. My wife and I were doing, or we were doing devotions with the family. I told my wife, I said, honey, that's what that Bible verse says for my life right now. And God, I don't know everything that I need to know right now. And I'm not okay with that. I need wisdom. Uh, God's put me, uh, he's placed responsibility on my life where... Uh, for lack of better terms, I'm going to have to, like, maybe figure some things out between me and God. Okay, God, what are we going to do? I can't go to Daddy anymore. I can't go to Brother Rhodes. I have men of God that I'm accountable to and all that, but uh, as a pastor of this church, I've got to figure some of these things out. So, Lord, help me, God. Did you know... As men and women of God, if we choose to take God at face value for His Word, He dares us to do it. Well, God, I'm just, uh, life ain't fair, and I always get dealt the worst hand in life. How come I can't ever get a good hand? Oh, shush! <laughs> it ain't about getting a fair hand. It's about making do with the hand that's been the deck of the, the, the deck that's been dealt, the hand that's been dealt to you. What are you gonna do with that? It's called responsibility. But but God has placed a special anointing on your life for today. And we need not that any man teach us. So somewhere inside of us, there's got to be an answer. But God, I ain't getting an answer. Well, maybe you don't need it right now. Maybe he's going to let you just kind of walk by faith for a few years. Like he did Abraham. But God called Abraham faithful Abraham, didn't he? So, even though we critique him and judge him, in those 25 years that it took for Isaac to come along, God said he was faithful. And you and I need to be faithful. See, in America, we've got to be able to, everything that comes along, we've got to critique, analyze, and figure it out. 
That's, that's because of the society and the world we live in programs our brains to work like that. And there's a reason that a lot of us Americans have problems with faith. It's because our world is not simple. Our world is maybe a bit too cluttered. Why is it that a barefoot Indian living in a mud hut can get a hold of more God than I can? Come on. I'm not saying we need to change our lives and become like that. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm here to say is what, uh, maybe our life has become a little too complicated. Maybe there's too many details that we're careful and troubled about and messes up our day. That's the question I've been asking myself. I've been asking myself that question, and so I'm asking you. God, what can I do to declutter my life? What can I do? Maybe I need a greater capacity. Maybe, maybe my brain needs to be enlarged. Maybe my soul, maybe I, need to, maybe I need to get smarter. Maybe I need to educate myself more. Maybe I need to learn more things. Maybe it might be help to a certain extent. Maybe. But could it just be that our answers are found in just moments and times and seasons saying no to everything else, saying yes to Father God? Those of you that have gray hair on your head, you could probably answer this better than the rest of us. Maybe. That's the answer. Maybe Simeon and Anna had a few things right. They chose to live in that temple or be in and out of that temple day in and day out, seeking God. Maybe everyone's life around them was too cluttered to be able to see the Messiah going right through their midst as a little baby. Maybe they were too caught up in everyday life and they missed it. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Those priests, they were... They were the religious leaders of the day. And I don't doubt or question their spirituality. They, they were probably good people. Did a lot of good for their generation. And helped a lot of people every day. Going about the duties of consecration and, and sacri uh, sacrifices and all the things that priests do and did. But the very Messiah... Passed right through their hands, simple little baby. And they missed it. <coughs> Could it be that the anointing of the Holy Ghost has been laying dormant in too many of our lives for a little too long? Because we missed it. We thought it was a light thing. Just such a small detail of our lives that was never urgent enough for us to pay attention to it. Just wondering. Just wondering. <clears throat> it comes upon, the anointing comes upon believers in different ways to accomplish the work of God, the work that God has planned for their lives. Every single person in here, there's, anointing, there's an anointing on your life. And it's going to look different to every person. But it's all moving the same direction. Let's go to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 
2 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 14, reading down through the end. Their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that Spirit... And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, it's you and I, hopefully, with open face, beholding as in a glass, not the world. Not the old ways of doing things. Not our old ideas, our old agendas. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord. Are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. We've got to behold the glory of God. It should not be a light thing for you and I to come into the presence of God as we just did, to sit in the presence of God as we are. It should not be a light thing for you and I. It shouldn't be a light thing when on Wednesday night we come together and pray and seek the face of God and, 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 and do warfare. It shouldn't be a light thing. It should be something that it's just part of my life. Ever since I was a Christian, when I was 17, I started planning my life around church. And so that's how it's been. And this prayer meeting, I'm here. If I'm in town, I'm going to be here. You ain't, ain't going to stop me. Well, you're a preacher, that's why. No, before I was a preacher, I was doing it. God's blessing comes on committed people. God's blessing comes upon those that are seeking the face of God. God's blessing comes upon men and women that choose Him first. First. The anointing breaks the chains of bondage. It's the unseen force that liberates humanity from the devil and from themselves. Any of y'all need to be liberated from yourself? Say, oh me. God, liberate me from the man who I used to be. Those old character traits, those old tendencies and leanings. That if we're conscious, they, they're going to try to trip you and I up. Even though we're dead to that old man, we've got to die daily, Paul said. We choose. We choose to keep that old man in the grave. But there's still that fight. There's still that uh, enforcing that we've got to do. Disgruntled, aggravated, irritated, tough to work with. No, that's not me. I don't want to be that. God, the anointing that's in me calls it to be the anointing that the same kind of character that Jesus would have had. That's his purpose. He was the anointed one. He was the Messiah. 
And he wants you and I to walk like him. He wants you and I to, to have the same character traits. Walking in mercy, walking in love, walking in forgiveness. Speaking words that are blessing. Speaking words that are hope. Speaking life into a darkened world. That's you. That can be you. That can be me. By the anointing of the Holy Ghost inside of us, you have an unction. It's in you. It's there. So God stirred up. Stirred up, God. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 10. Lord God, help us. Isaiah chapter 10. Now, this is, one of, this is a pretty awesome scripture. It says, Thus saith the Lord God of hosts in uh, verse 24 of Isaiah chapter 10. O my people that dwellest in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian. He shall smite thee with a rod and shall lift up his staff against thee after the manner of Egypt. For yet a little while, and the indignation shall cease. And mine anger and their destruction, the Lord of hosts, I like that word. I like the Lord of armies. I like the, the, the God that's leading his army into battle. That's him right there. And the Lord of hosts shall stir up a scourge for him, according to the slaughter of Midian at the rock Oreb. And as his rod was upon the sea... So shall he lift up after the manner of Egypt. And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy neck. How many of y'all got burdens weighing you down? Some of you mothers, you, you're, you're uh, everyday life and taking care of them babies. It's rough and tough. As sweet as they can be, motherhood can get difficult. I'm glad God didn't choose me for it. Because I don't know if I can handle it. But if that's a burden to you, God, Lord, help me, God. Help me to see this baby, this two-year-old, this five-year-old, this ten-year-old. Help me to see her or him the way you would want a mother to see this precious child. And so, God, you told me that you have, you've given me an anointing and an unction. And so, God, I need that unction and that anointing. That as a mother, I'm breathing fresh air... I'm a fresh air handler for my household. That mama's not controlling her home with sighs and rolling eyes all day long. It's part of humanity that we got to deal with sometimes. I don't know if God's got excuses for it, though. But it's a reality that we got to deal with. But maybe we can work on it. Let me say that a little different. Let's work on it. Amen. Let's work on uh, less size. Uh, I know, it's fun to vent every now and then, isn't it? Just like, whew. How about this? Thank you, God. <laughs> now, I'm not the type of guy that's so religious and awesome that every time I hit my hammer with a hit my finger with a hammer, I say, all praise God, hallelujah. I, I, I just find out it's better said, ouch! 
And I really don't feel uh, condemned because of that. And I kind of get mad at myself when I do it. It's like, Ugh! but I'll get over it in a minute. And there ain't going to be no cuss words coming. I'm, I made a decision about that a long time ago. Maybe I need to somehow work on instead of saying ouch and maybe I need to start saying thank you, God. I don't know. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe we need to go through a contest and let everyone's finger be hit by a hammer. <laughs> and <laughs> then we'll see who can say, thank you, God, and glory, hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> How's that? Yeah, so we need to work on that. <laughs> okay, I'm having fun here. Yeah, <laughs> I'm having fun. Okay, I'm, I'm 35. I'm going to start working. And I work with some guys that work with me every day, so they, maybe they can help me out. But, but I'm working on getting over that stuff a little quicker than I used to. Remember the days when at 8 o'clock in the morning someone came into your world and said something and you had a bad day for three days because of that? Uh, we need to work on that. Just because Johnny woke up in the morning and soaked his bed... He should have went to the bathroom. Okay, mamas. Let's don't let it mess up our day. You know, there's something pretty awesome. And I try not to take advantage of it, but I really enjoy it. And I don't put unnecessary pressure on my wife to have it, that it's got to be like this every day, because it's not. But being able as a hardworking man and, and the world around you and life and people that you got to interact with, and most of them ain't saved, so if they're having a bad day, they're going to let you know it, okay? And so you got to wade through that clutter each and every day at work. And to be able to come into a home that my wife has been watching over all day long and the son of peace, his hand is resting upon it, that is pretty downright awesome. It's awesome. Now, mind you, there are times I walk in the house and the baby's crying. And it's my responsibility as a husband to be empathetic with my wife. Say, so, honey, instead of saying, honey, what in the world is going on around here? There's toys everywhere. The baby's crying. How come you ain't keeping house the way you're supposed to? No, 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 no. No, these are days I walk in the house and say, okay, honey, how you doing? Because there's going to come a day where daddy's going to need her peace to help him out. Because he's going to come home from work and he got dumped on about two or three times during the day, unnecessarily probably. Or maybe he caused it himself. And he's kind of, hmm. It's difficult. And instead of you as a wife standing at the door saying, oh, what happened to you today? I'm being critical and judgmental because he ain't happy, laughy, dancy like he should be. Do you see how we need to kind of work together on some of this stuff? Yeah. I don't like the term give allowances for humanity. I don't like that term. And I, and I, but I think we need to give allowances to each other to be able to work through stress and things and issues and life that comes. We need to help each other. Because when we help each other, it lifts us up and it makes it easier. So as a husband and a wife, let's help each other. When I'm going through a difficult time, my wife is there to help me. When she's going through a difficult time, I got her back. And maybe it should be the same way in the body of Christ. Well, I tell you what, Sister So-and-so, man, she came come into church with a snoot the other week. And I said hi to her. 
She just mumbled and jumbled. Is that really the attitude that we need as brothers and sisters? Maybe we need to be a little more considerate of each other. Maybe I need to be more concerned about my attitude versus the attitude of everyone else around me. That's right. Maybe. Okay. So we're talking about the anointing. What time did I start, Nevin? 50 minutes? Okay. I got a little bit of time. In. And it should come to pass in that day, in, in Isaiah 10, 27, that his burden, we were talking about burden, shall be taken away from off thy shoulder, and his yoke from off thy neck, and the, the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. God, I need the anointing on my life. I need the Spirit of the living God to help me. Because there's a pathway that you've called me to, and it's a mountain that I don't know if I want to climb. The yoke, that yoke of not wanting to, can be destroyed because of the anointing. Getting into the presence of God gets our wanter stirred up. So what happened to me this morning, I woke up and, and uh, I didn't want to do it, but the first thing that I felt I needed to do was just start praying in tongues. Start praying in tongues. Did you know that's a yoke-destroying power that we have as individuals? If, if you've been given the gift of tongues, and if you don't have it, you need it. It's the greatest oppression reliever that I know of. It's the greatest depression reliever that I know of. Because when we ain't in the right frame of mind, our prayers can get a little selfish sometimes. <laughs> but there ain't nothing selfish about praying in tongues, about seeking God, about letting the presence of God wash over us. And Lord, help me to walk in the right, help me to walk in the anointing, God. You know, after a few minutes of that, my spirit was calmed. And the peace of God found its way through the clutter of my soul and my mind and my emotions. Simple surrender to God. Maybe life should be more simple. Just a thought. Do we need to figure out and reason everything about our lives and who God is? Or do we just need to say, yes, God. Lord, I'm here. Here am I, God. Destroy the yokes, God. Take away the bondage. I want to serve you with a pure heart. I want to serve you with a heart that doesn't have reservations. I want to serve you with a submitted and a surrendered heart. Spirit. And Lord, let my life be a sacrifice to who you are. For your glory and for your majesty. And let my life be a life that brings hope and freedom to others. And that's an inspiration to the world around me. Oh, God. Just a few minutes. Let's look at a few men in the Bible that talks about where the Spirit of the Lord came upon them. We need that. We need the Spirit of God coming upon us. Number one, we need Him dwelling in us. But continually, 
men and women that walk in the anointing, the Spirit of God moves upon us and helps us through the battles, through the challenges, across the difficulties. God's going to help you. He's going to help you. If you're 10 years old and you're bored with school, God's going to help you. You young man, you bored with school, God's going to help you. Lord, help me to learn everything I can. School is needful for children. It's very needful. Um, 1 Samuel 10, verse 5. And after, that, and after that, thou shalt come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines. It's talking about Saul. And it's talking about he's going to meet a company of prophets. And in verse 6 of 1 Samuel 10, it says, And the Spirit of the Lord, I like this verse, And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and thou shalt be turned into another man. Did you know there's times that come upon our life, if, if we stay on the journey and we stay committed to the pathway, those moments and times will come upon our life. And those moments and times will, 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 will propel us into the years to come. That's why it's important that this generation of young people that's on the scene right now, it's important that the Spirit of God comes upon you. God, fill me with your spirit. I need to be turned into something different than what a teenager is in this generation. God, I want to be something different. I want to be a vessel that's surrendered to you, God. That hungers after you instead of all the things around me and the, the things that want to try to clutter up every teenager's mind. The Spirit of the Lord shall come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shall be turned into another man. And let it be, when these signs are come unto thee, that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. There isn't a more awesome statement in life. I want God to say, or someone, I want that testimony to be of my life. And I think you should covet it in your life. God is with you. Men and women that walk with God. Remember the former, remember those days when heaven lit up your world? God was with you. Remember those days? First Samuel 16, 12. It's talking about David when they anointed him. And he sent and brought him in. Jesse came into town to anoint one of, uh, or Samuel came into town to anoint one of Jesse's sons. And in verse 12 it says, And he sent and brought him in. He was riding with all of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Wouldn't you like the Spirit of God coming upon you and working with you? You had this moment in time where the Spirit of God came upon you from that day forward. He was with you. Not that you failed Him all the time. Not that you didn't go through difficulties. He comes upon us to help us in the battle. Not to deliver us from the battle. Judges 14, 5. Then went uh, Samson down, and his father and his mother to Timnath, came to the vineyards of Timnath, and behold, a young lion roared against him. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. We need the Spirit of the Lord to come, us, come upon us mightily in this generation. I tell you what, he's here. Those of us that have been Christians for a while serving God, Let's stir, let's stir ourselves up. I believe if we go to Jesus, make the effort to press through the crowd, He's more than willing to allow His virtue to come out of Him when we reach Him. 
and reach him. But those disciples, when Jesus went after, uh, when they found him for the first time, Jesus was going after him. He was going after him. He's looking for him. There's people in this church, God's looking for you, He's coming after you. He's going to wreck your world. He wants to wreck your world. Oh, God. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily and he ran him as he would have ran a kid. Now there's a, a young lion. What? Grabs the lion and tears him in two. That's pretty amazing. Well, he was Samson. How, did you, how, how do you know you can't be Samson? How do you know that? Accomplish things that other people would never have accomplished because the Spirit of the Lord God's upon you. Mm, I, want, I want to be that God. God, I want to be used. It should be our desire. I'm going to start with that. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for your mercy. Thank you for your grace and your peace. Lord, the anointing is what we need. Your word says that we have an unction. And that we know all things. So Heavenly Father, to men and women of faith, that takes away all the excuses. Lord, deliver us from excuses, God. Lord, deliver us from wanting to be a victim. And Heavenly Father, set this church on fire. Set them on fire. Lord, stir them up. Stir every one of us up to seek your face. Lord, that we would love you. People around us would have the testimony that God is with her. God is with him. He's safe. He's a righteous and a godly man. She's a righteous and a godly woman. Lord, we've got to be more than just good people. Lord, every day good people don't make it to heaven. So God, we've got to be more than that. Lord, every day nice people miss heaven. Our life has got to be more about more than just pleasing people and, and the world around us. It's got to be about pleasing you first. And allowing that favor to rest upon us. And everywhere we go, we find favor with people. Not because of, of just being a nice and a, and, a, and a great person, but because you have put your favor upon us. So God, that's what we need. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Is there anyone in this place needs prayer this morning?